If you are in need of a Bible, you're welcome to get one from the back, provide those to serve you, and follow along as we look at the Gospel of Luke this morning. If you would turn to Luke chapter 12, if you're new to the Bible, it's uh, in the later part of the Bible. There's a number of books with names, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke chapter 12. And verse 35, we're in the middle of a series called Real Godliness in Real Life. I'm looking at a number of different topics this morning. I'm going to be focusing on one of the key motivations that we have for godliness. And as we look at this word to read, I want to remind us that the word of the Lord is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Because it pierces to the division of soul and spirit, perceiving the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, we come to this word in need of illumination, transformation, and fellowship with the Lord. Let's begin reading. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus is speaking. Stay dressed for action, and keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes, truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this. That if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. When we have relatives that come to visit us, grandparents and, and um, dear friends and so forth, one of the things that my children do that I know I did as a kid is to, to wait with a degree of almost frantic anticipation. I have a, an image in my mind of uh, my, my little boys standing, we have a table kind of in front of the, the window at the front door of our house, and just kind of standing there, gazing out the window, waiting, and, and waiting. And then you can hear, uh, before there's even a knock at the door, when, when the car drives up, the, the shouts resound, they're here, they're here. There's a sense of eagerness, there's a sense of kind of anticipation and, and longing and the, the very second, the very moment, they don't want to miss even the, 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 first, the first sighting of them as they come rolling into the driveway. And I think that Luke is attempting to build in us a similar, just as exhilarating, though perhaps more sobering kind of anticipation. He says, Jesus, in this parable, stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. He uses this metaphor, but the, the whole parable is essentially to say this. Wait eagerly for the return of the master. Live eagerly waiting. Live expectantly He's essentially calling our lifestyle to be one of eager anticipation. That's the main point of this parable. It's to build a, a lifestyle of eagerness, a lifestyle that looks like that child with his face plastered to the window looking for the first sign of the master's return. That's what Jesus calls the Christian life. 
It's the life of a child that is plastered to a window waiting for the first sign of his return. It's so oriented toward him that the, the sight of him when he returns captures our imagination, it captures our affections, it directs our lifestyle. There's a, there's a waitingness, an eager anticipation that is the Christian life. That's what Jesus says. And, and he says, don't, don't think of that as a, a temporary or a momentary or a seasonal thing. This is something you're to, to be like all the time. You're always to be like that child, which is his face plastered and his ears tuned to the first sound of the master's return. Our lifestyle is to be eagerly expecting Jesus. That's what godliness is. We're looking at godliness from the standpoint of our, our motivation. What, what kind of is the, the, the flavor of our life, the tenor of our life? And the, the tenor of godliness is one of anticipation. What, what this passage does is it, it takes godliness out of the realm of just something you, you do because you should and into something you do because it reflects something that's about to happen. It's not something we just do in the meantime. It's due because of this uh, perspective of waiting. Our, our, our godliness in this life is in view of what is about to happen, according to Jesus. Whether it's that our life comes to an abrupt end or it's that he returns, the meeting of Jesus is a certainty. And so he says, live eager for that meeting. Live eager expectantly is our lifestyle eager for Jesus return now we break down this passage I think uh, into three main sections now you look on your Bibles I, I, I always want when we when we talk about the structure of a passage for it to be evident in the passage uh, it's not something that I'm just kind of making up and I like these kind of points no let's look down there notice at the beginning there's this command section accompanied by this metaphor stay dressed for action keep your lamps burning and then he uses the metaphor of servants waiting for for their master. And then when you look at uh, verse 37, he transitions to some of the motivation of a reward. Blessed are those servants that he finds this way. There's a, there's a sort of motivation that's then included. And then the passage ends with his warning, a final warning in verse 39. He changes the metaphor a bit and uses this metaphor of a thief to explain about the abruptness of this coming, that there will be no kind of last minute cramming for the final test because you won't know when the final moment is coming. So I think the passage breaks down that way. There's, a, there's the initial command and then there's motivation for the good reason to fulfill that command. And there's a final warning about not procrastinating that command, not thinking you can uh, figure it all out in the last moment. Let's look at the command first of all. Verse 35, stay dressed for action. A uh, very common biblical metaphor uh, basically just means, look, don't be caught unclothed or unready for swift movement. It's a very, very kind of earthy metaphor, very normal and easy to understand. Look, don't, don't be caught uh, not ready for a visit. And you can just apply this uh, to your own method of uh, sleepwear. Uh, don't, don't be caught, so to speak, metaphorically, in your sleepwear when Jesus returns. Don't be caught drowsy-eyed heading to the door and, and wondering, oh, my gosh, Gosh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not more presentable. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't do that. Spiritually, metaphorically, he's saying that, that's not what the Christian should want. Spiritual drowsiness and unpreparedness and shock and surprise that he was coming it should not be the lifestyle of the Christian. And he uses this metaphor of keeping your lamps burning. He saying, look, you don't want the master to come home to a spiritually darkened house. You don't want the master to come home and see a lamp that has burned out and a, a servant that has drowsily drifted off to bed, spiritually speaking. He's saying, no, you, that, that would clearly not be the right thing. And he uses this metaphor of, of servants waiting for their master. So we, we don't have these kinds of servants, but these are bond servants. These are those that are bonded permanently to this master. They have committed themselves to him. He, he is their purpose, their calling, and, and he's gone for the evening to a wedding feast, it says. 
The, the presumption is that this is a late night event. This isn't one of these American weddings, you know, starts at one, it's done at two. This is not that kind of wedding. This is a late night wedding. This is a long time wedding. This is an hour after hour. When is he getting home wedding? That's the kind of wedding that's in view here. And he's saying, look, you, you want to be like a servant. Imagine that scenario. You're a servant. It's your responsibility to be ready for the master, ready to answer his call, ready to serve him as he returns from this late night event. He's saying, imagine a situation where there's a servant, and, and, and the servant is, is there. He is there at the table. He has kept himself awake and ready. He has the lamp burning. You don't want to be the servant that the master comes, and he knocks, and he knocks, and he knocks, and then and, and somewhere eventually the, the drowsy-eyed servant comes to the door. Oh, oh, I, I, I'm sorry you were waiting. Leads him in. All the lamps are off, and the master stumbles and trips his way in while they, they seek to, uh, to turn on a, a lamp. Remember, there's no light switches. So the idea here is the master has to stumble into a darkened house waiting for the servant to go find oil and, and turn on the lamp, and he has to stand there waiting for this. And the idea is, if, if you could get into that culture and think, what, what a shame for the servant. What a shame that his whole reason for being is this master. And the master comes home, and he, he's drowsy-eyed and asleep. He's not even fully dressed, so it's unpresentable of him to come before the master in that way. And then the, the lights are all burnt out. There's no, there's no light. He has to light the candles. The master's just standing there waiting. That kind of servant indicates that the master's return was not chief on his mind. The master's return is not what he's living for. The master is not his first priority. His first priority might be comfort. It might be, look, we need to get some reasonable rest here. It might be, look, I can't be asked to keep this lamp burning all night long. I got to get trips to the oil can and back and back and forth. This is ridiculous. This is monotonous. I, I shouldn't have to do these things over and over and wait. I can't be expected to wait eagerly all night long. That kind of servant just demonstrates you don't appreciate the honor it is to serve this master. And so in this culture, it would be this obvious thing. Oh, wow, what, a, what an embarrassment. What a shame. What, what a failure for the servant to have the, the lamps not even burning and to not even be dressed appropriately when the master comes and maybe not even to hear the first knock. The, the master of the house is outside knocking and no one even hears his call. That's the metaphor. And, and obviously Jesus is applying this spiritually, saying don't, don't, don't be like that kind of servant. Stay ready. Spiritually speaking, stay anticipating. D don't get caught thinking that the night of this world is what you're living for. You're living for a return. You're living for the moment that master comes back. D don't allow the flame of your affection and faith in him to diminish and maybe even burn away. Don't, 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 don't let the, the, the dim smokiness of a, 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 an untended lamp to greet the master on his return. No, quite the contrary. You want the, the, the house to be ready, bright, warm, welcoming, inviting. You want that to be the condition of the heart when the master knocks. You want to be like that child face plastered to the window. He's here. That is the lifestyle that Jesus is calling us, is calling his servants to, to cultivate, to build a sense of he's here lifestyle. That's the lifestyle of the godly Christian. Godliness in real life is godliness that is always looking to the next life. Godliness in real life is godliness that, that turns this life into a waiting moment, one long waiting moment for Jesus. That's what godliness in this life is. That's the command. Jesus says, look, stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Be like the servant. And how good it would be to be that servant, the master. He, he knocks it. Just the, the first half knock, the door is flung open. Welcome. Welcome home, master. I have been waiting for you. Come, come in. Come in. He sees the lights are all ready and prepared. The servant is fully dressed. He is fully awake. He is ready for the master to come home he's been waiting 
the whole time. Nothing was more important to him over the course of this long night than the moment his master would come back. And nothing should be more important to the Christian in the course of the long night of this life than the moment the master returns or we see him face to face. That shapes the priority, the purpose of our life. What's the purpose of the life of the Christian? We can say it this way. It's to be ready when Jesus comes. What's the purpose of your life right now? To be ready when Jesus comes. To live ready. That's the purpose of your life. That's one way to define the Christian life. What is a Christian? It's a a Christian is is a servant, a faithful Christian, is a servant who is anticipating face plastered to the glass, ear tuned to the door, ready for the master's return. Not surprised, not slumbering, not uh, (laughs) unclothed spiritually. No, ready. Now, now, certainly, as, as gospel-centered Christians, the, the, the chief uh, readiness that we have is found in believing in Jesus as the Savior. That's what makes us his servants in the first place. But, but I don't think the priority in this passage is on a salvation, sal- salvation readiness, a salvific readiness. I think that's certainly included. Because if you're not even the servant of the master, then, then you're dead asleep and have no interest in his return. You're certainly not ready for his return. But if you're a Christian, I think the focus here is on the, the disposition of heart. It's on the, the character and the attitude and the demeanor of the Christian. I don't think it would be the right application of this passage to say, well, I believe in Jesus as a Savior. If you look at your life and it's a life of slumbering to his glory in the anticipation of seeing him. I think this, this is focused more on the, the, the life attitude of the Christian, the demeanor of the Christian. Nothing in the passage indicates that you can be sort of a Christian and then complacent or passive. That's the opposite of what it's saying. It's saying a person who truly believes in Jesus as Savior lives anticipating his return. That's what a good servant is. It's it's an anticipating servant. That's the command. What what does that mean for us spiritually? Well, it's it's not difficult to imagine. We we know the rest of the scriptures. What does readiness look like spiritually? Well, readiness is a man who prioritizes reading God's word over his favorite Netflix show. It's not, not difficult to, to determine what, what is readiness as a lifestyle. Well, somebody that is, is reading the word of the gospel is building anticipation for the Lord of the gospel to return. Readiness is a woman who prioritizes prayer over Facebook or social media. Not wrong to do those things. But if we're asking about the lifestyle, let me just remove a caveat. Um, we, we think sometimes as... Um, kind of gamblers by nature. Well, 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 what if he just happens to return the one moment I'm not doing a kind of spiritual thing? Look, I, I don't think that Jesus' concern here is with the, the, oh, gosh, if he'd only come in at 10, I would have been in a great way, and he came at 11. That happened to be the one moment I was browsing. No, I don't, I don't think that's the idea. Let's think of a lifestyle here. He comes in, there's a, there's a lifestyle that can be, can be seen, and I think that'd be true even in the metaphor. It's not that maybe at the given moment of his return, the servant isn't, you know, reading his favorite scroll or whatever they would have been doing. You know, it's not like that's not necessarily happening, but you can tell a servant that his lifestyle has been preparing. His evening has been spent prepared. He might have done this thing or that little thing over here, but his lifestyle is one of preparation, and I think we can apply that spiritually. A man who consistently prioritizes God's word over, say, his favorite show. A woman who consistently prioritizes prayer over, say, social media. Readiness is a suffering saint who keeps asking for prayer and fights the temptation to complain. That, that's a, a ready person. Readiness is seen in the, the forgiveness of a heart that is tempted by bitterness and unforgiveness. Readiness, readiness is seen in, in the long-suffering saint, the saint that is patient and, and, and has self-control and is kind. That, that's, a, that's a ready servant who, who, who would not be shocked and embarrassed for the master to walk in on a lifestyle of complaining, arguing, grumbling, or self-indulgence. Readiness is, is a 
person who guards their tongue and rejects lying and slander so that the master doesn't come in to a, a, a servant that is, is, is spewing lying, slander, gossip, and, 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 and crude language all the time, but, but instead speaks grace and, and encouragement and peace and, and guards their tongue. That's a, that's a ready servant. Readiness is a servant who has been investing their worldly goods into the kingdom and into the help of others and not merely into gathering bigger and bigger possessions for themselves. That's a ready servant. It, it's not difficult to, to see what readiness looks like in any one area. The, the point is if we back up and say, look, is my lifestyle in general and also if I look at one area, is, is it ready? Is it eager? Am I anticipating? That's the command. When our focus is on him, we are ready for him. When our focus is on him, we are ready for him. Our lifestyle should be expecting Jesus at any minute. Any minute. That seems to be the... the, The sense of the passage, he may come at any minute. Readiness is seen in knowing Jesus and reflecting Jesus. Looking to Jesus and looking like Jesus. Because, of course, because of the Spirit, we fellowship with the Lord Jesus all the time. We encounter him in our our private devotions. We encounter him at the church when we gather and sing. By his spirit, the Lord Jesus is present with us. So what this is talking about is the moment when our faith turns to sight. Well, obviously, that moment is going to be more anticipated if by the spirit we've been with him and fellowshipping with him all along. If we do our work with a conscious sense of being in his presence, if we, if we serve our family with a conscious sense that he is there watching over us, if we, we guard our tongue and our heart and our eyes with a conscious sense that the Lord is with us by his spirit, well, then when he walks into the room, we have no sense of shock and embarrassment because he's always been there by his spirit. When our focus is on him, we are ready for him. That's the command. Stay ready, Jesus says. Keep your lamps burning. Don't be content with diminishing affection. Don't be content with despair overcoming faith. Don't don't be content with that. Be ready for the Lord's return. But he doesn't just give us the command. Isn't this so constant in the scriptures? It's what makes just sort of moralistic Christianity so unbiblical. He doesn't just give commands. He gives motivation for that command. He doesn't do it because I said so, though that would be enough. He says, do it because of this reason. Sometimes he looks back at his gracious disposition. In this case, he looks forward to the benefit to those servants who are found ready when he returns. Look down there at the the motivation section of this passage. Verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Remarkable, remarkable motivation. This word blessed, blessed, it essentially means more than just being happy. Uh, It is to be marked for God's generous and loving favor. If I was going to get my own definition of the word blessing, it means to be marked for God's generous and loving favor. It is to receive God's own intentional focus on our joy and well-being. To be blessed. It, the, the words, it doesn't just mean a sort of temporary or superficial euphoria. It, it's not the high of a soda, okay? This is the lasting sense of being the recipient of personal divine favor and the intention of God to do us good and give a return to the efforts we have made towards him. That, that is the blessing that Jesus is speaking of. There's almost a sense of a... A, a, a veil that is passed over the fullness of this reward that's just tagged with the title, blessed. 
I, I almost see it as, as it's almost like a, a heavenly secret that we know it's going to be beyond our imagination. And when we see the word blessed, we know that's what Jesus is talking about. That's what happens in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? Blessed are those who suffer for righteousness' sake. There's this sense of, look, there's a, there's a grand, heavenly, overwhelming, beyond imagination joy that God has in store for his people. And he describes that beyond our imagination, heavenly category of joy, just with this word, blessed. And so when Jesus says, Blessed are those servants the master finds awake. He is anticipating the kind of intentional, divine, focused, God's joy will be given to you. Then he doesn't stop there. Look down at your Bibles. Truly, I say to you, he says, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. John Piper calls this image the Bible's most astonishing image of Christ's second coming. The Bible's most astonishing image of Christ's second coming. What, what's the motivation for staying awake, for staying spiritually ready, spiritually to have our, our flame of affection still burning, our faith still burning? What, what's the motivation? A, a heavenly blessing that is defined, in this case, as Jesus himself, the master, clothing himself as a servant, setting up these ready servants at a table and serving them. Now, the shock of this, especially in this culture, is, is probably beyond our ability in a modern day to grasp. It, the shock of this statement. The master clothing himself as a servant. It, it, it's fulfilled, actually, uh, in, in not long when, when Jesus literally does this for his disciples uh, before he goes to the cross, where he literally takes on the gar garb of the lowest servant, takes on the lowest job, and washes their feet. It's fulfilled even more profoundly when Jesus goes to the cross, takes the place of a slave, and dies on that cross, taking on the filth and responsibility of salvation to serve his people. So in some ways, it's not a surprise that this same disposition to do good for his people is still present in the second coming. It's just that we still would be amazed when we see the infinite glory of this particular master, the overwhelming authority that he has, the overwhelming right of dominion that he has, the myriads of angels that serve him without question, the overwhelming adoration of the Father, the acclaim of his saints throughout history, the fear of his enemies, the fact that that one will take on the servant's garb and will position himself to ensure that those servants who were ready, they will receive heavenly honor and I will take it on myself to make sure they get it. It is beyond comprehension that Jesus himself will serve the waiting servant. There is a, a willing, voluntary reversal that somehow when he returns, there will somehow be a way in which this will be fulfilled. And, and heaven will observe the king of heaven personally devoting himself to bestow honor and rest to the servant that's been waiting. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how awkward that will be? somehow delightfully so because there'll be no false pride there'll be no false modesty there'll be no false sense of oh no 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 don't do that everybody will know this is ridiculous 
We'll be able to just enjoy it because this ultimately just reveals the glory of his humility. Listen, this is the motivation for being ready. And and what's shocking about this is being ready is not some astonishing responsibility. It's not like some shocking job description. It's not like an unreasonable request to be ready for the Lord Jesus. It, it, it's not as though this is like, um, wow, wow, that's, that's really unreasonable. Have you ever had this? I have this experience all the time. When somebody tells, this happens, sadly, my wife has to do this all the time. She'll tell me something that I should do that's very reasonable. And my reaction is to say, what you think is reasonable, I think is unreasonable. That happens all the time to me. And she has to, well, don't you think this is reasonable? And somewhere in my heart, I say, well, I don't think so. Listen, there's nothing more reasonable than creatures who have been rescued by the bloody redemption of Jesus Christ waiting for his return. Could there be anything more reasonable than that? Could there be anything more reasonable than the, the Lord of the universe finding his servants, anticipating him coming home, not spiritually sluggish, not spiritually distracted, not neglecting his knock, not, oh, wow, I was in the middle of focusing on myself, and then here you came. What would be more reasonable than to think the blood-bought sinners that have now become saints, the children of God would long for his return. What is more reasonable than that? What is more unrewardable than that? So what is this motivation but the the character of God revealed that the very nature of God flows out in undeserved blessing to people? The, The very disposition of God flows outward in undeserved blessing to his people so that even in heaven there is the revelation he's still being gracious. He's still giving us what we don't deserve. He saved us. We didn't deserve that. And now he's serving us. He's giving us some kind of honor in heaven. And and we still don't deserve that. So there's a sense that this, this idea of a gracious God will not cease when the Lord returns. It will continue for eternity. We'll still be surprised at the undeserved, servant-hearted nature of our God. We'll still be shocked that the Holy One humbles himself, that the Glorious One gives of himself. But we'll still be finding new moments of, of being shocked at how willing he is in all of his right of authority to give himself, to bless those who were waiting for him, which is what they should have been doing. Listen, there is nothing more exciting in your future than meeting Jesus and being ready for him. It changes your paradigm about godliness, doesn't it? Doesn't it change your paradigm about just just hard things in this life? being generous financially instead of buying the greater possession for yourself and, and forgiving that, that sinner that has wronged you instead of holding a grudge. We, we tend to focus on the, the pain of that moment right now. Jesus is saying, look, the, the reward of being ready in that way will be Jesus himself celebrating and honoring You for waiting for the one that should have been waited for by everybody. I love verse 38 because he makes it clear that that in this life, this waiting seems long. You notice that in verse 38? If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. He comes in the second watch or in the third. This is basically describing uh, this master is really requiring a long waiting. I mean, the second watch and all. The third watch of the night. Now we're we're kind of heading towards the end of the night here. I I think it's the idea. Look, 
how long do we have to wait? And, and doesn't that communicate his awareness that especially for suffering Christians and for all Christians, the, the wait in our limited perspective right now, it seems long. It seems like a long wait right now. It, it's a little bit like, you know, children. We're like children. God doesn't view us as adults. He views us as children. So we're like children. You know, it, it, it's only been five minutes, but it feels like forever, right? That, that's the way God is, is aware. Look, I, I know it seems like all night. Right? This is such a long time. Even though he is aware, it, it's, it's not very long. It, it's not very long. How long is one night compared to a lifetime? If you knew you had to stay awake for one night so that you could experience endless joy and honor for a lifetime, do you think you could do it? Think you could do it? And of course, it doesn't even fit because a night is even longer in this life than eternity for the future. But just for the sake of the metaphor, if somebody said to you, look, here's the deal. You're going to suffer. It's going to be painful. You're going to have to resist your flesh. It's going to wage war against you. There's going to be temptations. People are going to sin against you. You're going to have to forgive people that have harmed you. You're going to have to endure people that slander you. You're going to have to endure physical limitations. And all the while, your own soul is going to be reaching out for earthly things and you're gonna have to say no to them you're gonna have to fight against the temptations of this world even even if that was the case even if the whole night was a night of painful warfare and suffering even if it was the whole night one whole night of, of pain and, and suffering and difficulty and I, I I'd rather despair and yet I'm called to trust I'd rather indulge but I'm called to fight I'd rather be at war with God but I'm, I'm called to submit to God even if the whole night was that if the promise really was if you can endure one night one night eternal joy beyond your imagination will follow. Do you think you could do it? Listen, it's hard for us to see because we're children. We're children. Five minutes. It's like forever. This lifetime, it's forever. Jesus says it's not very long. I know it seems long. I know that it seems like the same sins. They just have to fight them again. Disappointment with someone. I have to do that again. That moment when life comes crashing in and, and you don't know what the next day is going to bring. You're saying, I have to face this kind of a moment again. I already did this in the first watch. The second watch again. Or when you reach old age and you say, haven't I endured enough trials? Do I, do I have to face a new experience of weakness and aging again? Do I, do I have to endure another marital moment? Do I, do I have to endure another injury, another moment of conflict? Do I, do I have to fight a, a new area of sin in my heart? Do I, do I have to do it again? It's so many times. Jesus says, it's one night. And of course we know that for the vast majority of Christians, it's not actually like that, even in that one night. For the vast majority of Christians, there's many, many moments of, of joy and relative peace and, and happy. It's not like every single moment is excruciating. Many moments are joyful and delightful. But yes, there are moments, and if I can speak to you, if you feel like you're in a moment where the night seems long, it seems long right now, it feels like a second watch moment, and, and it seems like there's still a whole other watch to go. If it feels like that right now, it feels long, the suffering feels long, the uncertainty seems long, the, the fresh battle against the same sin seems long. If that seems long, listen to Jesus' promise, blessed are those servants. If he comes in the second watch or the third, blessed are those servants. It's almost like he's saying, look, the longer you wait, the more the celebration that you waited. Anybody can go to sleep when they're tired. The servant that stays awake is the servant that is blessed upon his return. 
that there's a sense of celebration. How amazing the grace of God that has sustained me to wait and lean into God when I just wanted to go to sleep. There's, there's a sense of the longer the wait, the, the more the sense that the night is lengthening, the longer the difficulty, the longer the trial. There, there's a sense of even, even an increasing capacity of joy and celebration when that night is concluded. That's actually ex- exactly what Paul says when he's talking in 2 Corinthians. He, he says this, look, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, We do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away and our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Listen, for this slight momentary affliction. Remember what happened to Paul, beaten three times with rods and five times. This slight momentary affliction. What is it? Not that it's not painful in itself. Not that it's not long in itself. It's short and slight and momentary in comparison. It's preparing for us it itself, the affliction itself somehow in the providence of God, the waiting itself somehow, the length of time somehow in itself, that is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, the darkness of the night, the length of the waiting, the pain of the battle. We don't look to those things, but we look to the things that are unseen for the things that are unseen are transient. They are passing away but the things that are unseen are eternal this is what Jesus is saying in a metaphor fashion he's saying look it's the very length of the night that somehow in the wisdom of God is is preparing the greatness and the weight of glory that is showered upon that Christian who has held on for his master's return that is our motivation and then he brings a final warning a final warning if you look down at your bibles uh, it says there in verse 39 he sort of changes the metaphor so again this is just a parable right changing the metaphor because he's concerned about a false assumption but know this that if the master of the house this is using a new metaphor if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So new metaphor, we have a head of household, and he's saying, look, if if he had known, how do thieves operate? Uh, They don't operate by sending you a save the date. That's what Jesus is saying. Hey, on March 4th, I'm going to break in. That's not how thieves operate. He's saying, well, obviously, the whole point of a thief is they catch you unprepared. He's like, obviously, he's using this metaphor. Obviously, if if the master of the house knew, if if some guy knew what day the, the thief was coming, if you knew, what would you do on that date? You would be prepared on that date. He seems to be saying that you could have the idea that, well, look, I don't need to live ready. I'll just get ready right before he comes. Kind of like the guy who knows March 4th, the thief is coming. What are you going to do? Well, you got your deadbolt and you call the police and everything's ready. Flashing lights. That would be like the person professing Christian or non-Christian who says, well, I don't have to live ready. I'll just get ready. Somehow I'll know in the final moment and I'll get ready in the end. Right now, I'm sleeping in self-indulgence, but I, I can wake up later on. I can wake myself up. Have you ever had that thought when you were younger? Oh, I'll wake myself up. Has it ever turned out not to be the case? Some people maybe can do that physically. No one can do that spiritually. You can't wake yourself up spiritually. What Jesus is saying is, look, what this is going to be like is the way it is for a thief, where great harm and damage is done precisely because there isn't preparation all the time. Look, you don't pick a date in the year to lock your front door. And I will do this April 1. I will lock my door. And that will be the day that somebody comes, oh, the door is locked, and walk away. Now, what do you do? You lock it all the time. You prepare 
all the time. You close the back door all the time, right? All the time. Because you don't know, and that's what Jesus is saying. You won't know. You won't know when the moment will come. You won't know. You will have no advance warning, no save the date, no calendar mark, no indication that this is the day, this is the moment. What he's saying is he's warning servants who assume they can procrastinate readiness and cram for it at the end. I did that in college all the time crammed for it at the end. Late night, all night, paper writing and so forth. I mean, I remember the, the fear and loathing that happened in that moment. I mean, it was a terrible experience, but at least I knew that it was due the next day. He's saying, you won't be able to do that because you won't know. It'll be more like those dreams you have about college. Some people, I have them. You, you have where you, you just wake up and it's the day of the final. And you think, how did I happen? To, the, the entire semester is gone. That's what it'll be like. You'll wake up and Jesus will be here. Actually, his coming is what will wake you up. That's the picture. And I think the thief is intentional because for those, and especially I think this addresses those who are not believers in Jesus. They are not Christians. They don't claim to be servants of the master in any meaningful sense. Jesus will be more like a thief than a savior in that moment. It will be more like the loud noise that's heard, and actually there is somebody, and actually he is a lot stronger than you, and he's been telling you to get ready all this time, and yet he came and found you sleeping, rejecting his lordship, and turning toward your sin, and in that moment there will be no preparation. It'll just be you and God face to face with your life scattered about in your unpreparedness under his gaze. That's what it'll be like for every non-Christian. And so in the mercy of God, he gives passages like this to help us understand in real life terms, what would that be like for you? To find out this overpowering force that will do you harm has come without warning. That is the reality for every person who doesn't believe in Jesus as Savior. Jesus will finally be Savior or Judge. If you are not a believer, you cannot wake yourself up later. There is no guarantee that hardness of heart will suddenly crumble on its own. Let me give a different category. If you are a professing Christian, you maybe have had years of following Jesus, and yet right now you are walking in a pattern of deliberate sin. Not momentary sin, not a battle against sin. You are intentionally walking towards sin. Look, the Bible gives no confidence of salvation to those who are intentionally walking in a lifestyle of sin. It gives no confidence of salvation for that person. Because a genuinely converted servant of the master who has encountered Jesus at the cross and had their sins forgiven, do they have moments of wandering? Yes, but they return by the grace of God and come back to him in repentance and faith. If your current trajectory is away from Jesus and towards the sluggishness of this life, then we can say on biblical authority that he will come like a thief. And if you do not have a, a lifestyle that is loving him, and waiting for him, then you cannot have confidence you are ready for him. And yes, there are passages in the scripture that, that talk about those who for some season of life had every appearance of following Jesus, but then in a final moment, they ultimately reject him. Now, we do not believe that happens to a genuine Christian. But it's a separate thing to say there are those who claim to be Christians and yet in their heart they harbor basically an independence that turns them away from God and towards sin. They are not ready in the final moment. Get ready. Do not indulge sin. Do not 
walk intentionally in a lifestyle of rebellion against God because God is coming. If you are a Christian who is genuinely, imperfectly struggling and battling for faith, coming under the authority of God's word, repenting consistently of areas of sin, let me affirm you. You do not need to be perfect to be ready because Jesus Christ died in your place. You do have to be ready to be ready. So if you've claimed him as Savior and you are leaning towards him, then you can know that when he knocks, you will go running. He is here. There is nothing more exciting in the life of a human being than being ready for the person who saved them from their sin and promises them the eternal reward of himself. Every action you take to be ready for that moment is the best thing you can be doing. Let's pray. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that you delay only because of your mercy. And we do pray, Lord, for those that are currently outside of your salvation, that you would save them. Please, Lord Jesus, please rescue those that have rejected you. Please, Lord. Lord, for those that are currently in a season of rebelling against you, fighting your authority, giving in to the indulgence of their flesh, Lord, please bring conviction. And Lord, for all of us, Lord, let us offer right now freely to you, Lord, any area of life where we have been slumbering spiritually, Lord, any area of life where we've allowed the flame of our affection to grow dim. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me, Lord. Lord, let, let us be ready, eager, excited. Let us cleanse any area of life that is, is unprepared morally for your return, unprepared to be held up in honor to you. Lord, help us to, to fight that fight. And Lord, thank you that finally... Finally, the only reason we can be in that house at all, the only reason we can be trying to prepare for you is because you gave your life for us. And every sin, Lord, those we've already committed, those we will still commit as we battle against them, Lord, they were cleansed by your blood. And that somehow sinners have become servants who will be served by the Savior on the last day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus.